Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Humanist Climate Action's event looking at the importance of biodiversity. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection involving mutation and variety in biodiversity is a really important element to the humanist understanding of the world. So this event looks at the threats to biodiversity, both in the UK and internationally, and what we as humanists and environmental activists uh, should be doing to help prevent its further degradation. We have excellent speakers lined up tonight, uh, all experts on environmental activism and how it relates to protecting biodiversity. Before introducing them, I'd just like to say a few words about Humanist Climate Action. As you may know, we founded this section of Humanist UK just over a year ago as a place where humanists who are concerned about the issues of climate change and environmental degradation could come together and campaign for positive change. In that time, we've had a presence at the COP26 marches, participated in Climate Coalition's Big Green Week, responded to several consultations by the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and we've also built relationships with other relief, uh, sorry, religion and belief groups campaigning in this space. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, please sign up as a member of HCA on our website if this uh, sounds interesting at all. Uh, so our first speaker tonight was due to be Sean Berry, but unfortunately Sean isn't feeling very well today, so she won't be joining us. Um, but luckily we do have two other expert speakers lined up. First is a Humanist UK patron, uh, Norman McLean. Norman is Professor Emeritus at, in the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences at Southampton University. His research interests and in writing span genetics, genomics, fish, conservation of wildlife and molecular biology. His books on these subjects include Silent Summer, The State of Wildlife in Britain and Ireland, Animals with Novel Genes and Commitment and Differentiation. He will be speaking about the main threats to biodiversity in the UK and what we could be doing either as individuals um, in our own actions uh, or campaigners to protect our diverse environment. Our second speaker is Professor Zoe Davis. She is Professor of Biodiversity Conservation at the University of Kent. She is not only a leading expert on conservation management and policy, but has researched the human well-being benefits derived from experiencing biodiversity and how people's attitudes, perceptions and values have been shaped by their relationship uh, with biodiversity in their surroundings. So she'll be speaking to us on these fascinating topics. Uh, so without further ado, um, let's get on to our speakers. Um, I'd like to pass over to Professor McLean. I mean, I should explain that uh... Although I'm retired, I'm still fairly active in the wildlife cause. And over the past two or three years, I've been putting together a book called The State of the World's Wildlife. And uh, in one of the chapters that I wrote myself in the book, although most of them are written by other people, I've included a list of the factors which have brought about the calamitous reduction in wildlife across the world. And uh, most of you will be familiar with many of these. I mean, as well as climate change, there are factors like agricultural intensification, the pollution of freshwater and seawater and air. Uh, I suppose the human population has continued to grow and that poses problems, partly because of urban expansion and industrial expansion. And then there's been a lot of deforestation, especially in rainforest, and there's been a lot of overfishing. But the positives are that in the, over the past five years or so, there are quite a number of um, indications that things are getting better. One of the main ones is the recovery of populations of whales. You remember whaling used to be a major industry for many countries. And now the only countries that are active are Japan and I think some of the Inuit in uh, Spitsbergen. So there's been a dramatic recovery of many whale species. And I think that's great news. Really. It just indicates that if we put our mind to it, recovery is possible. And something the same has happened with tigers in India. The tiger population was drastically reduced in India and across the range of Asia where the Bengal tiger occurred. And lots of them were shot and people wanted tiger skins and tiger bones and all manner of things. Um, well, that's largely reversed and the tiger numbers are now increasing once more. So these are global 
um, sensations or global activities which have changed the picture. I mean, in the UK, we can see a number of changes ourselves. There's been reintroductions of birds like red kites, which were close to extinction and are now common in southern England and parts of southern Scotland. Um, and I think all these things indicate that recovery is possible and we can use conservation management, uh, sometimes across the board, but sometimes focused on individual species um, to help things along. So I think that actually the future is not without hope. Great, thanks for those opening uh, remarks. Perhaps we could um, go on to Professor Davies then. Well, yes. So when I was invited here, um, I thought about the best way to contextualise this. So obviously I'm very passionate about the issues around climate change. Um, but to me, I come at this from very much a conservation standpoint. So I agree with Norman in terms of I think the health and state of the natural environment has never been of, of as great concern as it is now in policy. Um, in the public's domain um, and in, in what I call practice, which is actually people doing things on the ground from all different perspectives. But I'm concerned that um, actually the environmental crisis is dual. It's biodiversity loss as well as um, climate warming. Um, so as a conservationist, I've very much been advocating for my peers and the public to seize this agenda and make sure that biodiversity is actually really at the heart of climate change policy. Um, so let's go back to 2018. We have Greta, she started her school strike for climate. We had Extinction Rebellion launching an uprising against the UK government. And within a few months, these grew into mass civil movements and they really changed people's narratives on the environmental issues we're facing. Um, as I've already mentioned, it's becoming really high profile in the media and with political discourse as well. Um, and it's influencing policy at many different levels. So as a consequence, for example, um, there has been in Argentina, um, Canada, France, many other nations, um, a declaration that yes, there is indeed a climate emergency now and we need to start dealing with it actively. Here in the UK, there's also been some initiatives that have been launched as well. So for example, our government has pledged to increase woodland or forest, I use the terms interchangeably um, in this instance, increased cover from 13% as it is now up to 19. And the idea is that by 2050, this process will actually um, lead us to having net zero carbon emissions. It's very much being kind of billed as the panacea to climate change. Um, but in reality, it's a very complex issue and it warrants very careful consideration. So let's start with the fact that the, the environmental crisis discourse is really imbalanced between climate and biodiversity globally. Um, both are grave and both are, I think, as important as each other. However, most of the public have heard of the IPCC. Um, they are understanding that the science is in a really um, unequivocal place in terms of what anthropogenic um, impacts of what people have done to bring about climate change. However, when I speak to members of the public, they are far less familiar with ITBES, which is the Intergovernment Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So this is the equivalent on the biodiversity side. It's far less well known. And that's even despite in recent years, them coming up with some really alarming figures that we are currently um, facing the extinction of another million species in the coming decade. So these are really quite frightening headline figures. And indeed, research funding, research outputs um, and media coverage of the environmental crisis are very much pitched on the climate change side as opposed to the biodiversity side. Um, but I want to stress to everybody, and I think this will be of interest to the audience here, that these two things should not be addressed in isolation. They're very much um, synergistic. And that's because intact ecosystems are key to all our efforts actually to mitigate and adapt to climate change. If you think about the natural climate solutions, by which I mean things like the conservation of restoration of or creation of forests, wetlands, whatever ecosystems it may be, um, most of these things actually depend on having intact communities of plants and animals in place. 
So for example, if you start to lose biodiversity within forests, even if you still have a forest, so by things like hunting or different pressures, some of which Norman's already mentioned, so invasive species, all sorts of things, these forests become less able to um, adapt themselves and reproduce and sustain themselves. So if you start losing, for example, the animals that are um, that, that disperse seeds, your, your forest isn't actually going to regenerate properly. So you might get some, but it's not going to be fully functional. The other thing to remember is intact ecosystems are actually the most cost effective way of of providing a defence against the severe impacts of climate change. So things like droughts, um, flooding, physical storm protection. Um, and they really are going to be critical to all global adaption efforts for climate change. The other thing is um, human adaption to climate change will probably mean extra pressure on ecosystems. Um, as Norman mentioned, agricultural intensification has happened around the planet. In some of the most biodiverse places in the tropics, poverty is extreme and people very much rely on agriculture. And when that can't or, or starts to fail because of climate, people tend to go back to um, relying on forests, for example, for subsistence and income. So they go back into the forest and hunt and this sort of thing. So these issues are all completely wound up in each other. And, and this is what makes it so complex in terms of addressing both together, because there's all different sort of feedback loops going on. So in the rush to implement solutions to the environmental crisis as conservationists, um, we've got to make sure that biodiversity is really at the heart of all future decision making. Otherwise, we could have some really drastic and unintended consequences. Um, and we need to make sure that we can adapt to climate change and, and mitigate it and make sure that's a positive step for biodiversity as opposed to a trade off between the two things. Um, so coming back to the UK and talking about the fact that, you know, we've got these really quite ambitious goals to increase um, tree cover. That's all very well and good, but most of the time it's actually non-native species that are planted um, in these uh, kind of uh, plantation, commercial plantation setups, rather than re-establishing native uh, woodlands and forests. This is, you know, this is this is what's happened in the UK over the last hundred years. So actually, when you look at it, we we more than doubled tree cover. So it looks great as if you just look at that statistic. But actually, most of it is plantation. So we need to switch that emphasis to actually let's create new woodlands that are beneficial to biodiversity. Let's make sure that we source the trees from the UK and Ireland and make sure that we're not importing them. And therefore, all the issues associated with uh, carbon emissions and diseases from importing different um, non-natives from further afield. In the UK, it's also OK. So if we are going to start increasing uh, forest cover, where do we do it? So there's a real debate and problems at the moment with the idea of potentially putting tree cover on peatland, because peatland itself is an amazing resource for carbon. Um, it gets locked up in the soil um, and it's a really high carbon stock. So as much as trees are a really good solution as well, we can't do something that's you know, bad for um, a different type of biome and what it can offer. We've also got to remember that we do already have forests and that should also be a priority. Um, in the UK, we have some amazing ancient woodland and veteran trees that are just an absolute delight to biodiversity um, and support amazing uh, number of species and different types of species. However, most of it is in a really poor state. So about 7% of native woodland is considered in good ecological condition, 7%. And by that, I mean um, having you know, decent amounts of dead wood to provide extra habitats um, with the veteran trees present, diversity and age structure. Um, most of our woodlands also exist in very, very small isolated fragments. And that means that species can't move between them, which is obviously a problem with climate change. Here in the UK, we're on the northwestern edge of most species ranges. So as it warms up, species want to move north and west. And they can't if they're trapped in these isolated fragments. 
They also can't sustain really good populations if the fragments of woodlands, for example, we do have a very, very small, which in most cases they are. And because of this, we've seen a 41% decline in woodland butterflies since the 1990s, early 1990s. And we've seen about a 30% decline in woodland birds since the 70s. If you talk, look at it across the board of all UK woodland species, 10% are threatened and at least well, more than half are declining. Um, so yeah, we need, to, we need to think about these issues and how we address them, but also how we protect what we already do have. And most of that is of real value, but being neglected. Um, I'm, I come at this as a person who is really interested in the intersection between biodiversity, but also people. So a lot of these climate change policies that involve um, forest uh, creation or restoration very much focus on the biophysical impacts. So we're going to transform this landscape, we're going to plant trees, but they forget about the people that are an integral part of that landscape. But actually public backing and stewardship um, of, these, of these initiatives is really critical if they're going to be successful. Um, by ignoring local communities are going to be impacted by these sorts of things, raises severe ethical issues and also hinders potential support. So we've got to actually look for triple wins, triple wins for climate change, biodiversity, but also people. We can't overlook the social and cultural benefits that can be provided. Um, so when I keep hearing this rhetoric about the new um, uh, woodland cover target for the UK, it's all the right tree in the right place, but it's also the right tree in the right place for the right people. And I don't think we should forget that. Um, this comes also at a time when it's widely accepted now in research and policy and practice that interacting with nature is really, really important for the well-being of the population. We all saw this with COVID. Um, and the fact that all of a sudden we really started to value green space and access to it um, and, and people wanted to go outdoors. So actually for a long time, a lot of the European nations, for example, have had policies in place that specifically targeted at improving people's well-being and aiming to do so via encouraging human nature interactions. If people have higher levels of subjective well-being, and by that I mean how they view their own well-being as opposed to how a doctor might do so. Um, if people have higher levels of subjective well-being, they tend to have much better physical health. They tend to also have much better mental health. Um, and these things combined are really important. And it means that actually on average, people with high levels of well-being live a decade longer than those that have lower levels. Um, and I think we're all beginning to be increasingly aware of the importance of mental health. So in Europe these days, it's estimated that one in four of us will be impacted by mental ill health at some point in our lives. And it accounts for about 20 to 25 percent of the disease burden across the population. So it's of real interest to the health sector. Um, the NHS, for example, estimates that people interacting with nature uh, essentially has a, a value, if they put pounds on it, of about two billion a year. So, you know, really quite substantial. The other thing is, if you go out into these green spaces, this is where the average population, I mean, I think all of us probably on this call are really passionate about biodiversity, but I'm talking about the public at large. Having local green spaces to go to is really important for getting people to understand and engage with biodiversity, not only for their own health and well-being, but also so they just understand it. So they start seeing things and start getting a passion for biodiversity and potentially um, conservation issues. I think we've got to remember that the, the environmental crisis is human driven. Um, it's human behaviours that cause most of the situations that we find ourselves in. And it's actually changing people's attitudes and behaviours that's going to be the solution um, to actually making sure that biodiversity and climate change are, are halted or biodiversity loss is, is halted. Um, again, I come at this as a conservationist. So I hear a lot of people and I talk to um, a lot of people in local and regional government who say, oh, green space, OK, that's great. It's really good for people. We can just 
put a lawn in, we can mow it so it's about that big and everyone's going to be happy. So I've been very interested in recent years, okay, what is it about biodiversity that brings these benefits? And we still don't know. I mean, we know about, yes, nature has benefits to health and wellbeing. We still don't know enough about biodiversity. Um, So I think this is an area where we've all got to reflect on it and think about it and actually promote to the decision makers what it is about biodiversity that brings us wellbeing. Um, So yeah, I I suppose I was reflecting when I was asked to give this talk about what we can do from now onwards. And I think that the humanists and and people like myself, conservationists, we really need to reinforce our efforts to engage with decision makers. Um, We have done through existing channels, but we've actually failed to deliver the breadth of policy change needed so far. Um, I think encouraging people at large to think about civil movements, but also taking action, speaking to governments, getting involved with their MPs is really, really important if we're actually going to start making the shifts, particularly from a biodiversity focus and start catching up um, with what's been happening on the climate change front. I think that's really important moving forwards if we're actually going to embed biodiversity into mainstream policy decision making. Um, Yeah, well, I'll leave it at that for the moment and I'm more than happy to engage with questions. So just just wanted to pick up the discussion uh, while we wait for a few questions to come in on a couple of points made. Um, in, in terms of kind of, you know, regaining, you both kind of spoke about biodiversity in terms of what we have, what we've lost and maybe, maybe regaining. So in, in terms of uh, reintroduction of species, I just wondered if you kind of had any thoughts on that in terms of how that's managed, you know, which species, obviously at the moment I feel kind of the the beaver is the kind of poster animal for reintroduction. That's the one that you see in the news quite often at the moment uh, doing relatively well. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on on that in general and and how it's managed. Can I make a comment about that? I mean, I think that if you listen to the politicians in the context of climate change, they're full of promises, but it's all very much in the future. Whereas the problems are now, so I think that their agenda needs to be revised in the context of the fact that the problems are with us now and things have to be done quickly. And there's no evidence that that's taking place. Really. Yeah, so Laurie, to follow up on your point, I think that reintroduction is one, one thing in our toolkit that we have as conservationists. Um, but it is a relatively expensive thing to do. Um, so I do think there needs to be thought and care in terms of why we reintroduce certain species and what we're hoping to achieve. I think the beaver is a really classic example because it fills a specific function and does so really, really well, which is why it's termed as an ecosystem engineer, because it completely um, changes water courses and the flows of water. Um, which is really, really valuable um, for many uh, biodiversity and kind of ecological reasons. So it has a real function. Um, There is the term, which I'm sure you all heard, rewilding, which means many different things to many different people and involves um, a lot of different potential types of management. But I do think it is probably the best way forward in terms of... um, passively letting regeneration occur when I say passive I don't (laughs) I don't necessarily mean not doing much to help it along but allowing things to recolonize um, in their own um, way as opposed to just occasionally tokenizing reintroduction um, which I think can happen um, that particular species are wanted because it's part of somebody's agenda or what they want to do. What we want to get back to is really healthy, fully functioning ecosystems. And I think that should always be the priority um, as opposed to just potentially introducing charismatic species. Could I also say that uh, often in local introductions, there are serious problems. I mean, the white-tailed eagle was very successfully reintroduced into Scotland and there are now large numbers of them there. But there was a recent introduction into the Isle of Wight, and it turns out that most of these birds have already been poisoned by gamekeepers who put out poison bait. So it's it's not all going in one direction. And uh, often, in order to try and 
cope with the problems of climate change, you've got to be aware that uh, you'll have enemies as well as friends. Yeah, I think it's really critical to address the threats and the issues before going ahead with action like that. And, and also, I think conservationists, this is why we need to engage with local communities before we take actions that, yeah, might cause distress to certain people and sectors of society. I think there needs to be a lot of groundwork put in place to make sure that um, everybody's on board and can see the benefit and also feels that they have been engaged and their concerns listened to. Great, thank you both. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in now, so uh, let's dive into those. Um, the first one, uh, funnily enough, I might actually be best placed to answer. Um, it's how does nature conservation or lack of conservation uh, contribute to HCA's main issue on the climate emergency? So um, I'm uh, the coordinator for, for HCA, so um, it might be me that's best to answer that one. But I think what I'd just go back to is actually what you were saying earlier, Professor Davis, about it, it not just being you know, climate change on the one hand and biodiversity crisis on the other hand. These are interlinking issues um you know I think I think you used the word kind of dual crisis or you, you know you also said there were the three strands as well um so you know I think I'd just go back to that and say I don't think you know we're going to be successful in any of these areas if we see them as just these siloed problems exactly. with you know one solution to this and another solution to that it, it has to be kind of an all-encompassing um in terms of policy as well um so the next question that we've got there, uh, it's from John from uh, Watford Humanists, I think. John is asking, um, has any economic analysis been undertaken as to the financial benefits of safeguarding biodiversity? Um, so he said, for example, safeguarding pollinators and the economic impact that the loss of the pollinators would actually entail. Yes, there is an extraordinary amount of um, economic analyses now going ahead, trying to put valuations on biodiversity. Um, so actually putting monetary values on so it can be incorporated in decision making. And um, actually, the pollinator example is fantastic. And I think it's one of those where the value is so ginormous in different countries and different areas and regions. It's meant that actually people have taken the crisis very seriously and realised that actually the benefit of having healthy ecosystems next to agricultural land and, and pollinators um, functioning is so important for agriculture. And the cost of importing, so like in America, for example, they import huge numbers of hives into um, fruit growing areas, for example, um, because otherwise the, the pollen um, won't set, fruit won't grow. And, and the economic cost of that is massive. Um, so those things have gone on, but it's a hugely debated um, area because a lot of people feel very uncomfortable about putting economic values on. A, because the methodologies are still, relatively speaking, they've been around for 10 years, maybe 15, but they're still in their infancy. Um, but also there's other reasons to um, value biodiversity that aren't economic. And I'll let Norman take over. I was going to say, the person who knows most about the problems of pollination is David Goulson, who has a chair at Sussex, yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. written two or three books about it. And so I think that he's the person who's looked very closely at how you can recover populations of bumblebees and hoverflies and so on to help in pollination. And there's an anxiety which he's expressed that lots of farmers import colonies of bumblebees yeah. in order to help with pollination. And actually the long-term consequences of that for our local bumblebees is not very good. Uh, so it's a complex issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. But, but to reassure people, yes, economic analyses are being done. Yes, they're being taken on by decision makers, but we've also got to remember there's all sorts of other ways to value things. It's not just economic, although that tends to be the agenda from government. Yeah, sure. But there are also all the cultural values we have, all the social values we have, things that are harder to put, you know, dollar signs or pound signs to, for instance. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's when you when you were talking about the, the kind of the well-being and the people thing, yeah. you mentioned a figure there, was it two billion? It's NHS? two billion a year, yeah, NHS. Yeah. And that's probably out of date now. I imagine after the COVID crisis, they would increase that quite substantially. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's almost the sense of that there almost has to be that angle on it perhaps yeah. for the decision makers. 
definitely. So from my personal perspective, I tend to engage in the economic and also the non-monetary ways of valuing things. And I like to present both in the work I do because I think there's different audiences, both policy and practice wise, respond differently to the two different things. You know, just because just because a species might not be worth anything to people in economic terms, it could mean an awful lot in other terms, culturally, for example. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the next question we've got in is from Joshua. Um, he has asked, or he said, uh, a comment was made earlier that the audience here is likely to already be converts to the course. Um, so what are your thoughts both on how best to get the message across to the people that aren't actually hearing that message or kind of, you know, tuning in with that message? Well, I think you've got to buy time and television in order to do it. Uh, I mean, all the betting companies know very well that if you want to make money out of betting, you've got to advertise on the telly. So I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to raise money and spend it on television programs, which are inserted into other programs so that people are made aware of the problems. Yeah. So again, I think this is a really complicated, but excellent question um, to think about and try and answer. I mean, if we just look at the respect that David Attenborough has across the general population at large, he is a trusted um, source of information. It, it's extraordinary when he has, um, so for example, you know, Blue Planet, and he focused um, people's minds on plastics and the impact they're having on the oceans. Um, public sat up and listened, and that's then put a lot of pressure on um, decision makers to uh, actually act in a, in a policy uh, way okay not necessarily quick enough but um, I think having the right advocates is is really important I think we shouldn't preach I know um, a lot of members of the public I speak to think that a lot of conservationists sit in ivory towers completely disconnected from everyday life for most of the, the public um, so I think the way we need to communicate is by showing people that yeah we understand the pressures of life um, and we're not, you know, we're not, we're not preaching it, and we understand, and it's about just getting people to realise the small things they can do, how it can build up. Um, we've tried a lot to take people into woodlands and, and things like that who have never been engaged. If you can try and get people out um, and into these environments, I think their responses change really rapidly. So we took um, some people who were urbanites who had never been in a woodland into Sherwood Forest um, back in 2019. And it was really remarkable for, to watch them go through this process of discovery as adults and actually see with their own eyes um, what the biodiversity was like, the things they could do and all the sensory things they were engaging with. Um, and I'm still in touch with a couple of them now and they're actually taking their kids out of the city and, and going to find biodiversity. But I think we need to make it as easy as possible for people to engage with biodiversity. So this is why I don't think that conservation action just should be um, outside cities and urban areas, which is where the majority of the population live. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think there's many, many different ways that we can start to get people uh, converted and keen like we are. Professor McLean, did you want to come back in? Yes, I, I used to be involved in running student field courses at Easter time in the south of Spain. And most of these students had had no previous experience of being out in the field, of walking through meadows and so on. And what was so noticeable was that if you took them out and gave them the names of what they were looking at, they, it transformed them. They noticed things that they had never seen before. Because there's a difference, isn't there, between walking through a field and knowing the names of things and walking through a field and not, it's just a green field. And so a certain amount of education of the public can, I think, do a great deal to enhance the concern for uh, the future of our environment. And of course, David Attenborough does that particularly well. I mean, actually, I don't know if people are aware, but there's a new um, GCSE being launched in natural history that starts um, next year. And I think and hope that it will be really important and another way for people to access just what Norman has described, actually. I also think we need to be more inclusive. So conservation in the UK is um, unintentionally, but is very white. 
dominated. I think we've got to think about all sectors of society and making sure they feel that they can engage with the environment. In my experience, that's not always the case. Um, so I think we've got to think about, you know, different ways of engaging different sectors of society. Um, and there's some really fantastic initiatives out there and there's some real kind of um, fabulous uh, young advocates uh, from for wildlife from all different um, social backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. And I think that's really helping as well, engage a wider audience. Right, so someone's asked a question, it's just going back to uh, what we were talking about on reintroductions of animals. Um, so they said, how well can reintroductions work when the climate and ecosystems are actually already changing? And might we sometimes have to introduce alien species that will survive such changes? I kind of have a slight question to add to that. I saw something in the news about an alien species, I think that was being introduced to canals in the UK, and it was to combat an invasive species. So might we need to kind of add aliens to combat invasiveness? Interesting question. Oh, yeah, lots of things going on in that question. Yes, I probably should have mentioned this earlier with reintroductions. What are we reintroducing back to? We could be reintroducing back to the Pleistocene era, for example, which people have discussed in North America, when we had, you know, elephants on the plains and things. You know, where where do we want to go back to? And I think this is a really interesting social debate um, because we have got to be aware that um, our planet has changed and evolved um, with taking away from the anthropogenic pressures. So I do think where is your baseline and why why do you want to go back to a particular baseline and what should that baseline be is something that's worth considering before we, we do anything that's retrospective and pushing things back to how they were. So yes, I'm very cognizant of the fact that ecosystems are changing and evolving and we, we should be um, careful of what we're trying to manage back to I think we should be more forward facing and it you know some species won't do well out of climate change in the UK but maybe that doesn't matter because they're doing really well in other places in Europe I mean there's also the scale issue so governments think in national boundaries so for example I did my PhD on a on a butterfly species called the silver spotted skipper it was doing really, really badly um, back in the 70s in the UK, but it's done remarkably well as a result of climate change. But a huge amount of conservation um, effort and finance went into looking after the species in the UK, when actually all across Europe, it was doing exceedingly well. So there's also that question of, is it worth investing in one particular location for a species that's actually doing really well elsewhere across the national border? Um, so, yes, uh, all sorts of things like that. In terms of the alien species, we have a very, very bad record of biological control. And introducing a species from another place, like place A, to place B to fix a problem. Um, they tend to, or quite often, that's really high percentage, I think it's about 30, 40 percent of the time. It has unintended consequences that are pretty darn negative. So you know, things like the cane toad in Australia um, are classic examples of biocontrol gone hideously wrong. So I think anything like that needs to be done with extreme care and a lot of research. I think we should also be aware of the fact that uh, conservation uh, tends to target species which are popular with the public. Yeah. Uh, and it's tempting to do that because people are... People like to see red kites or white-tailed eagles or peregrine falcons. But really the hard work of conservation is to restore communities in which these species exist. And I think that we should focus much more, as you were saying, Zoe, uh, on you know, recovering English woodland. But we have to realize that if you lose something like a piece of woodland, it may have been a hundred years in the making. Yeah. So it's not a quick fix. It's something we've got to start, but don't expect quick results, don't you think? Great, thank you. So the next question we've got is from Pauline. And she's asked if uh, either of you have any particular ideas on how to persuade people to become more active or any particular organisations that you know of that are particularly skilled at influencing the decision makers and the policy makers. 
Yes. Okay. So I think there's various different um, ways you can do your bit. So there are a lot of great conservation organisations out there, for example, where you could go and be part of it. So like your, your local um, wildlife trusts or um, your local, I don't know, um, Woodland Trust Reserve or Butterfly Conservation or um, the British Trust for Ornithology, who do things like surveys regularly and monitor the state of wildlife on particular sites that might be near you. You can get all the well-being benefits from going, but actually that data is used by other people in the organisations in really valuable ways that actually provide an evidence base to decision makers to help inform policy change um, or um, academics like me use that data. So there's ways that you can do it like that. And I think there's a lot of citizen science initiatives um, that go on as well in all different shapes and sizes, like um, the RSPB have their monitoring your back garden birds um, and butterfly conservation do similar things each year. And I think if people get involved in doing that, then they tend to their passion tends to rise and then they want to get more active in doing things that are more influenced directly at decision makers, like engaging with MPs or, um, for example, joining Extinction Rebellion or, or doing things that are more kind of actively putting pressure on decision makers. And some of whom, by the way, are really on board with some of the challenges and causes that um, are passion, you know, we're passionate about, but obviously they've got other considerations and life is always about trade-offs and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm just also going to say we're very fortunate in the UK because essentially every county in the UK has got a wildlife trust. Yeah, they're amazing organisations. And, uh, and these are, are people who are already dedicated to doing what they can to conserve wildlife. So one of the first things to do is get in touch with your wildlife trust and go out with them and participate in their actions. It's often focused on individual little nature reserves. And uh, I mean, I belong to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Naturalist Trust, and they're very active and they've had a lot of success. But I also think just don't expect too much of yourself and no one will in these organisations um, and just start small, don't overface yourself. and. And just, yeah, go out and start exploring. We can even all do things in our own garden in terms of, you know, I don't mow my garden between April and then in the autumn. Um, and my lawn is now amazing. So I live in East Sussex. I now have pyramidal orchids popping up in my lawn and that sort of thing. And that's that's just a small little thing that I've done in my garden. Yeah, I've let the wildflowers grow. And that has a tremendous impact. So, you know, I'm now seeing a huge number of different butterflies, for example, um, and bees and hoverflies and things like that. So, yeah, there's all little small things that we can do um, that make, you know, collectively a large impact. Yeah, I mean, David Gilson appeared on one of Monty Don's programmes saying just that, and he's tried to wildlife part of his own garden and he showed us, you know, the difference between what it was like before and what it was like after. Uh, so it was much wilder and, of course, had many more insects in it. And, of course, if there are insects there, the birds will come as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and don't feel that your little patch is too small, because actually the nice thing about gardens is there's lots and lots of small patches, but they all tend to be quite contiguous along a street um, and lots of people be doing lots of different things. And that heterogeneity, that variation is really good for biodiversity. I mean, some of the surprises, I think, about what's happened locally is to see that common birds like sparrows and starlings have declined so much. And I think that is partly education. People don't realise that although as adults these birds feed on seeds very largely, they have to feed their adults on insects. And if you use insecticides in your garden, you will actually greatly diminish the populations of house sparrows and starlings. And the, I mean, the decrease in many parts of the country is 70 or 80 percent have already gone. And it's happened mainly in towns. It has, it's not in the broad countryside. It's a, it's a local town effect. And so it's happened in people's gardens. Definitely. And I, I'd just like to, to re-echo that, uh, the point about kind of no space is too small as well. I live in London. Um, on the 11th floor, I have a balcony and I get bees visiting me. So, you yeah. know, yeah. 
you know, anywhere, any little space (laughs) that you can find. Yeah, fabulous. Right. So uh, we've got a comment here from Sun. Um, It kind of relates to something that you said um, a little bit earlier, Professor McLean. Sun is saying kind of, do you agree that it's a bit of a red herring sometimes to highlight uh, the small number of success stories, uh, such as whales and tigers in India, because they give the public or you know a bit of a false picture that everything's getting better, we're on the right path, when actually in other areas, um, you know, wildlife and habitats, it's it's really going downhill and biodiversity is getting a lot worse than better. Um, you know, that, that just reminded me of something you said about um that, you know, the the animals that the public like tend to be the ones that um, you know, the organizations concentrate on sometimes. Yes, it's so difficult to get the balance right because most wildlife is not doing at all well. And, but it's tempting to concentrate on the good stories because they're much more positive. But there are many more bad stories than good stories and it would be lovely to be able to reverse that ten trend. I mean, some species in this country have really re- recovered their numbers almost without a lot of activity by ourselves. And these include animals like polecats um, and um, weasels. Well, a weasel a bit less than polecats, but um, pine martens have, have also recovered in many parts of the country. And they've done so almost spontaneously. So it's not all bad news, I think. Um, yeah, so from my perspective, I and this is, a, again, a, a big debate um, within the NGO sector in particular, which is, do you just keep giving people the bad news? And how does that make the public respond? And how do they feel about, for example, I mean, I don't know if you remember about, you know, five, 10 years ago, there was a lot of imagery that was really quite shocking being used, especially related to the um, wildlife trade, for example, and bushmeat hunting of, you know, people with dead animals slung over their backs or um, lion rugs, tiger rugs, things like that. Um, or, you know, really quite gory images, shock images were being used of elephants with their their tusks ripped off and kind of lying in pools of blood. And I think there was a real feeling that that sort of messaging um, attracted attention from certain sectors of society, but made other people just switch off. And they were just like, no, this is too big a crisis. We can't deal with it. We're not succeeding. What's the point in even trying? So I think the positive conservation messaging is equally important when we can show people, yes, we can do things and it can be successful. And yes, we can do things that are even small in our back garden, but they have an impact. So to be honest, I think that it's judicious to use both approaches because, you know, the general public isn't one entity and different people respond to different sorts of prompts and messaging. So I think, um, well, that, actually, there's a movement called Conservation Optimism. You can Google it. Um, and it's a lot of conservationists saying, hey, we need to actually tell people that this is doable because now they're just switching off because it's all doom and gloom. Um, so, yeah, I think I think conservation is trying to use both approaches. I'd like to say that I'm so pleased that this event has taken place. I mean, I've only been a humanist for about 10 years. And whenever I joined, I started trying to... Um, make humanists interested in the natural world. And this discussion this evening is a demonstration that some of it is going the right way. So I think it's wonderful what is taking place. Glad to hear it. Thank you. (laughs) Right, we've had a comment here uh, from Jeff. It's a good point. Um, He's saying, we keep referring to climate change when the reality is we're in a climate crisis or emergency. And he said it may seem like semantics, but language does affect how people can visualize the situation, reality of the issue. Um, do, do you agree about that kind of the use of language? I mean, particularly maybe in the media and, and how we speak to each other about the crisis? Yes, I do. And um, I'm as guilty as anybody of flipping between the two. Um, that's because with my research head on, I tend to think about it as climate change because I'm doing it in an objective manner but when I talk um, publicly I normally use the word as I said like environmental crisis or um, a climate change crisis biodiversity crisis however as I've just said I think there are um, sectors of society that will switch off if we always use the um, 
completely negative terms. And sometimes it's better to be very objective in the way you communicate with some people. Um, but yes, I take the point. And yes, I think in general, we should probably now be using climate crisis and climate emergency as the kind of um, normal language. Yeah, and science does, has a bad reputation for making things sound confusing and using Latin names in preference to English names and so on. So I think it's important to realize where we are, that we've got to talk about daisies and dandelions and bumblebees and frogs and toads and so on. And that's where we've got to start, uh, ensuring that people understand what we're talking about. I suppose one of the things you can do is encourage people to build a small garden pond and look to see whether they, they have frogs in it next year, as they probably will. So there are quite simple things you can do to put, bring forward the, uh, the benefits uh, of negating climate change. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Ashton. Um, he has asked, how did the participants feel about ERG scores being brought in to try and quantify climate change risk management and hold businesses and corporations accountable? Um, so I think that's in relation to kind of assessing the natural hazards based approach to, to assessing kind of climate risk. Yes, I think there's been all sorts of different strategies to try and get particularly businesses to realise um, the impact of what we call their externalities. So the impact that they're having um, more widely and make them accountable. I think all those things are really important. Um, I think businesses do need to be pushed further than they are um, or have been historically. Um, I think there are always um, issues with quite a lot of these sustainability metrics because they tend to be, oh, like with all indicators, they tend to be associated problems with them. So I think suites of these things should be used as opposed to one set um, in particular. Um, but, but yeah, I think anything that is transparent and people can use to make informed decisions about where they source um, services or products from um, and that sort of thing can only be beneficial in the long run. Any thoughts on that, Professor McLean? No, no. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think that uh, the, the cost, the, the financial cost, is not low. And in the present context, a lot of poor people are finding it a real struggle to survive. So there's no use lecturing them about climate change. What we've got to do is persuade the people who've still got some in reasonable income to be more involved in their local issues, I think. Yeah, um, and businesses globally are a huge landowner. They have a massive impact in terms of the staff that they employ. Um, so I also think just as much as kind of the environmental side of things, um, thinking about it from the social impact they have on communities and things neighbouring their businesses, but also their employees, anything, you know, in the broadest sense, um, companies should be looking at their sustainability. Great, thank you. So we've got um, a question here from Sun. It's um, about kind of the causes of biodiversity loss, really. Um, so saying that rather than it being a consequence of man-made uh, climate change, it's more destruction of wild habitat, um, and in particular, a consequence of converting land to agricultural use to feed livestock. So the question is, is the best way to stop biodiversity loss to advocate and help introduce less consumption of meat and dairy, um, which will reduce the commercial demand for kind of that land use um, and kind of destroying those kind of wild habitats to, to grow crops for livestock? I do agree with that. I mean, I'm not a vegetarian, but I feel I ought to be. I think that um, eating, producing beef is a very wasteful use of our countryside. And yet we insist on doing it because of the huge appetite we all have for hamburgers or whatever. Um, how you move a society from being mainly carnivorous to becoming more vegetarian, I don't know, but we should certainly be trying to do that. Um, yes, I agree. I think it's one of the things in the toolkit. Um, obviously, there's lots of other threats to biodiversity um, other than just agricultural intensification and land use change, although that is massive. Um, so, yes, I, I agree. Um, and I do think there's actually been a huge shift in people's diets again over the last uh, five years in particular. Um, so I think we're moving in the right direction. But it, again, 
I think we need to address different sectors of society in different ways. I can remember growing up thinking that vegans were really strange human beings because most of them I'd ever met were um, really scary, quite aggressive people that used to really kind of um, seemingly growl at me about, um, you know, being a teenager eating a steak, for example, which is what I did back then. Um, so I think there's different ways of communicating. And the, the lovely thing I think about now and, and the discussions around diet is there seems to be far more um, flexibility in terms of how people want to label themselves, what that actually means. And on the whole, that means that actually we are reducing the amount of meat consumption because people don't feel they've got to be at one extreme or the other. There's all sorts of different gray areas in between. And I think when people start reducing their meat consumption, think actually, yeah, now I'm, I'm really liking these plant-based alternatives. Then they start including more and more of that into their diet without feeling, oh no, suddenly never, you know, having a piece of cheese again or an egg. That just seems too drastic. Um, I think I think the kind of uh, variability on labels and uh, options on offer are really helping the diet switch. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, saying you mentioned earlier human attempts to survive the effects of climate change could have a further cost on biodiversity could you explain this a bit further yeah so for example in certain parts of the world um particularly the tropics where you've got huge amounts of biodiversity um that's where most of our biodiversity is but that's where poverty tends to be highest um people um tend to be uh, smallholders. So they will have agriculture that they're using for their subsistence or they grow things um, so they can sell it at markets and produce some sort of income. Um, this tends to be in areas that were forest and that have been cleared. So, you know, I'm talking about places like Uganda, for example, there's, you know, classic protected areas and right up to the border of the protected areas, it's smallholders clearing land um, to produce crops. Um, so, for example, with Uganda, um, some of the regions, it's like sugarcane is, is one of the main things that's grown. Um, when there's droughts or floods or climate change related issues to these extreme weather events, um, we know there's huge amounts of research. Uh, you know, I've done research in Madagascar on this sort of thing as well, where the community shift because you have crop failure on quite an epic level. People can't survive. They can't produce the income um, off their agricultural land or they don't grow the crops and um, the crops fail that they need to eat. So what people tend to do then is go back into forests, for example, and hunt. They hunt bush meat, um, so wild meat to survive or go and take to the market and sell and get income so they can buy other supplies. And then this tends to cause knock on implications for biodiversity and, and cause biodiversity loss. Um, so these sorts of patterns are quite well known so yeah it, it is an issue and we we have seen examples of this all around the tropics i mean there are some attempts going on to re-educate our farmers um in the in the days when there was a lot of stubble after crops of wheat or whatever had been cut a lot of birds would go and feed on the stubble because there was a lot of spilled grain but no farming doesn't do that anymore but some farmers now are beginning to put out packs of seed themselves. They'll go and distribute it in the autumn and the winter on tracks or in corners of fields. And I think that's having a huge influence. You can see very large flocks of birds like chaffinches and so on coming to feed on the grain because they used to do it in the fields after the stubble. It's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so Adrian would like to ask, or he says he, he's a bit worried about encouraging people to go out into the natural environment. Um, so the question is, is there a balance to be found between increasing interaction with nature and avoiding, avoiding damaging it? Or is it a misplaced concern? So, I mean, I think maybe Adrian is thinking of, you know, we saw some scare stories uh, during the pandemic of when people were going out into nature and there were, you know, pictures of beaches covered in rubbish and, and that kind of thing popping up on the news. Um, and, you know, various other things like that. I think the, inf uh, uh, the influence of people on, the, on, on wildlife in the British environment is very low. A lot of, we still have quite a lot of wildlife which hardly ever sees a person. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't always so when people went out with guns and shot everything that they could see. But I think the tide has turned 
And so the, there's a lot that can be done in the present context. Yeah, I get asked this a lot. Um, and yes, human disturbance is an issue. Um, so, for example, a lot of a lot of the public have dogs and they like to take dogs on site and it can be a real disaster on some sensitive sites for ground nesting birds, for instance. Um, so, yes, I think part of it is just um, encouraging people to think about the environment they're going into and respect it. Um, I think if there are particularly sensitive sites, um, you can think about restricting access at times. But I'm, I'm not really a fan of that. I think um, nature is a public good, essentially. So I think everybody has the right to, to access it. We know the benefits it has. And as I said before, we also know that when people start engaging with it, they start seeing the value of it and therefore tend to um, be more willing to change their behaviour and their attitudes. So um, we know that conservation in the past has been really unsuccessful, right? This is why we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis. An old fashioned conservation was very protectionist. It was put a fence around something and keep everybody out. But that doesn't work. We've shown it doesn't work because we're still losing biodiversity at really rapid rates. So looking forward, we need to think about ways of coexisting. Um, and for encouraging people to enjoy the benefits of biodiversity, but be more sensitive about the way they do it and make sure they're protecting it. Great, thanks. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Steve. So he's uh, talking about kind of, I think, urban biodiversity um, and also uh, food, food production. So he's saying, what can urban areas of the earth do to feed themselves, given the example of vertical farming? Yeah, excellent. Um, so... Um, I've worked in urban areas for a lot of my career as well. Um, the urban allotments are an amazing resource. Um, they are, again, really good for storing carbon. Um, and actually quite a lot of produce can be um, derived from them. And obviously then you have less emissions um, and things uh, associated with food imports. Uh, if you're really interested in this and um, can Google uh, Jill Edmondson, who's at Sheffield University, she's done a lot of really nice work on this in the UK and, and the value of growing your own um, in urban areas. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's not a panacea in terms of we're never going to be able to support whole cities based on urban agriculture. But yes, vertical farming yes um engaging in growing stuff in your garden um uh, or having an allotment it's all got a part to play i mean another of the effects of climate change is that our country is getting drier and there's less rainfall and this means that fire is an increasing hazard so we should all be aware that starting a fire in the countryside can have catastrophic consequences uh, we all used to, I mean, I went out in my youth and made picnics in the new forest and lit a fire and fried sausages and so on. But I think that those days have gone. We shouldn't be doing it anymore. I've got a question from John who's asking, given an available space is a solar farm or a woodland, the best action in that space for the benefit of our climate and biodiversity? It might be a tricky one. <laughs> I think they're both important. <laughs> I thought I would say the same, which is really unhelpful. Um, and I've probably got splinters in my bum or it seems that way, like I'm sitting on a fence. But no, um, it's really context specific. So um, obviously I'm really pro uh, renewable energy because that is the way forwards. Uh, however, there have been examples of solar farms being um, put on sites that are really sensitive for biodiversity and they're being quite extreme consequences um, as a result. So as with everything, I think it's just, it needs to be done properly and there needs to be some common sense. Um, but both renewables and, and the kind of natural climate solutions are both important and should be used uh, synergistically. Yeah, um, I mean, Germany has tried quite hard in this direction, hasn't it? So it's made fields with solar panels. Yeah but try to ensure that there's some wildlife underneath the solar panels. Yeah, and it can so be done really, really you well. You can get the two to work together. Yeah, you can. That sounds ideal, um, both at the same time. Uh, a different John has asked a question, and um, so it's relating back to something uh, that was mentioned earlier. So he said, 
I mentioned that campaigners tend to be white, middle class and often middle aged. Um, also said it's been reported today that India and Pakistan uh, have you know, record temperatures at 50 degrees C, um, which is obviously almost unbearable for, for human life. So what approaches are being made to Indian and Pakistani communities in the UK to get them to promote climate control and biodiversity development um, back in India and Pakistan or could be made? Oh, um, there's quite a lot in that. Um, so when I made that comment earlier, I was very much talking about it from a biodiversity perspective in the UK. Um, I mean, I can't comment. I honestly don't know in terms of what's being done with um, Indian and Pakistani communities within the UK to promote climate control and biodiversity um, loss reductions over in Pakistan or India. I, I honestly don't know. Um, so I'd be lying if I, I tried to um, kind of think off the top of my head in that regard. However, there's lots of initiatives in the UK with lots of organisations realising that, yeah, the people who engage in conservation um, tend to be of a particular sector of society. There is a lot more being done to encourage the youth. Um, so, for example, uh, British Trust for Ornithology um, are doing some really great stuff. They've got a whole youth board um, now and they are really asking young members what they want from the organisation and how you know, young people can engage and what they want from it and where they see their future. And those sorts of initiatives, actually asking the younger generations what they want to do is, is really important. And then you can start actually engaging with them meaningfully. Um, there are a large number of youth advocates for climate and biodiversity um, who are engaging at government levels as well. Um, and I think social media has been really critical in giving people a voice. Um, I mean, I'm a complete social media numpty, so I'm not, again, the best person to actually chat about that. But I, I know it's had quite profound influence in getting people heard um, at a level that maybe they wouldn't know otherwise how to in engage or interact with policy makers and decision makers. I was just going to say we shouldn't feel too guilty about it all because climate change is actually very ancient. If you think of the Sahara Desert, a few thousand years ago, it was green. There were elephants and rhinoceros and people living together in a green area. But now the Sahara is increasing in size every year. So it's not a new phenomenon, it's simply that we're at the receiving end of something that's been going on for a long time. But of course, it's become acute, whereas it was kind of chronic in the past. Yeah, yeah. There's also um, some really quite interesting people from um, ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK who are starting to have a real voice. So if you look up um, Mara Rose Craig, uh, she's called Bird Girl on kind of Twitter and that sort of thing. She's from a um, uh, British Bangladeshi background and she's really, again, been encouraging people from minority backgrounds to engage. They have all sorts of um, kind of clubs and groups that people can can go to. Um, and I mean, she's very much bird focused, hence Bird Girl. But I think there's all sorts of initiatives like that that are starting to have a real impact as well in getting different sectors of society engaged. Fantastic. Um, and this is a, a quick question, hopefully. Um, someone's just asked for a reminder of the uh, Organisation for Biodiversity, which is the equivalent to the IPCC for climate change. Yes, so it, it's IPBES, so I-P-B-E-S, and that stands for the Intergovernment um, Science Dash Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So a bit of a mouthful. And I think that's probably why the uh, the name hasn't caught on, like IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, which is a little bit more simple. Great. And I think Rachel has just put the link to that in the in the chat. Um, Fabulous. But it's exactly the same structure. So all the countries around the world engage in it and write um, regular periodic reports updating on the state of biodiversity and, and what we call ecosystem services, which is what nature gives people um, for free. Great, so we've got um, another question here about kind of the links between the climate crisis and biodiversity. So someone saying, um, so measures to stop biodiversity loss would have a direct impact on controlling man-made climate change. But do you agree that the current measures that are trying to control climate change, such as reducing fossil fuels, wouldn't necessarily stop biodiversity loss? 
And they've said that the, the biggest action on stopping biodiversity loss is to stop further habitat loss um, and then kind of rewild. Well, in a way, that's what we were saying before, that there are one or two aspects. So whether you concentrate on a community or on a species, and I think we've got to try to do both. And so some aspects of climate change activity uh, will help particular species, but they will also do, do much more by helping communities. Uh, communities like, you know, woodland or heath or lakes or rivers or whatever. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate what I said before, which is, yes, there's certain actions that can be done to benefit climate change, the climate emergency, um, that won't necessarily have an impact on biodiversity, but biodiversity is pretty damn critical to protecting us against the adverse impacts of climate change. So I think that's why really the argument is that biodiversity really does need to be prioritised and, and make sure we've got these intact functioning yeah. um, ecosystems. And in the last week or two, there's been quite a lot of uh, press coverage of the fact that a lot of sewage goes into our rivers. And we've really just got to take action and stop that because the rivers are great sources of, uh, of the spread of plants and animals. Uh, and if we pollute the rivers as is going on, it means they're no longer the resource that they once were. And so uh, it turns out that you know, thousands of tons of sewage are put into even beautiful rivers that look pristine, but are contaminated. Great. Um, so the next question uh, is quite a specific one, and um, we'll just see if, if you guys have any thoughts on it. So it's about tackling the adverse impact of Chinese traditional medicine, for example, on pangolins or rhinoceros. I used to have I used to go to China quite frequently because I had a research collaboration with them. And when I got ill, they were all, always offer me either Western medicine or Chinese medicine. And there are, then, I don't know what the state is now because I haven't been there for a year or two, but certainly then there was a huge initial belief by Chinese people in traditional medicine, most of which I think there was no evidence that it was of any benefit. Um, and so usually I tried to persuade them to give me Western medicine, but often then it wasn't available. And all you had was herbs that somebody had gone out to collect in the forest. There is a huge amount of research that goes on with wildlife trade, both illegal and legal. Um, in terms of the Chinese traditional medicine, um, I think there's kind of two ways you can tackle it. One is to look at the supply side. So how do we prevent these species being exploited? And then there's also the demand side, understanding why people want to use these medicines, what they think the benefits are, and trying to educate them otherwise. Um, it's really interesting because a lot of Chinese people, for example, a lot of the research shows that people don't necessarily believe that it's going to be effective. A lot of it's about status. There's all sorts of social and cultural factors woven into it. So I think we really need to fully understand the situation to um, actually then start to be able to uh, solve the crisis. So for example, with ivory, there is a school of thought, which is that you make it legal to actually have ivory products again, because actually quite a lot of the trade these days is about subverting the system. It's about the fact that there's no supply. So therefore prices are pushed up, they're higher um, and that it's a status thing to have it. So there is an argument that you flood the market and then people won't be as interested anymore. Um, I mean, I don't work in this area, so I wouldn't like to say what I think the best strategy necessarily is, um, but there is a lot of research going into it. Um, and it is, yeah, it's quite complicated. I mean, it's such a shame that animals like elephants and rhinoceros and uh, some others, you know, people want to get tiger bones or rhinoceros horn because they believe that it contains an aphrodisiac. But it's complete nonsense. There is absolutely no evidence. And yet rhinoceros horn is still a very valuable commodity on the, on the worldwide market because of this fictitious belief. Or the status that's associated with it, even if people don't believe it. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so next one's not really a question, but we've had a very kind offer from someone named Alan. 
He said that he's had a bumper crop of acorns in his garden and hundreds of oak saplings and would like to offer them to anyone that's wanting to recreate woodland. Uh, so perhaps we can a turn it into a question and uh, if you have anything further kind of to say on uh, woodland rewilding or oak trees specifically. Um, but Alan perhaps if you'd just like to kind of put that in the chat as well and then if you wanted to add your contact details or anything people could get in touch. Yes so I've done that before um, I, I yeah I had an urban garden in Sheffield until relatively recently and all sorts of things popped up in our garden and I used to dig them up and offer them on free cycle or gum tree or that sort of thing to local neighbours and just spread the word in local community groups and we people always came and took our little saplings away or we kept them and grew them up um, if you really do have hundreds, um, you could contact maybe Woodland Trust might have somebody, um, a local contact on their books that could help as well um, and put you in touch with somebody who is trying to actually do some woodland creation or restoration and would be grateful of the offer. Yeah, because oak is such a valuable species. There are two or three different species of oak, but uh, it's a native to Britain and there are lots of other wildlife depend on oak, on oak trees, whereas trees like uh, horse chestnuts and sycamores are not native to the UK, and these are spreading everywhere, and actually there aren't many things that use them as food. So by all means, plant acorns. Let's get more oak trees. <laughs> yeah, um, also the, the what lo your local wildlife trust. Also, um, depending on where you live, there might be a tree planting initiative going on if you're living in a, in a town or city who would be grateful of having some saplings that they could have for free, but move around and get people engaged. Lovely. That's all plant the right trees. So uh, we've got a question from Ian. Um, Thinking specifically about the humanist approach, would you agree that we need a sense of wonder, uh, which is something that some religions, uh, you know, is kind of a part, a part of them and that they do encourage? I couldn't agree more. I think that that's where a lot of it starts. And we've got to encourage our children to look, to be out and have a sense of wonder when they see insects or flowers or something like that and realise how wonderful they are. Um, so I think we have lost some of our sense of wonder because we're so um, so focused on walking the streets of our towns rather than being out in the countryside. Um, yes, yeah, so the work I do on well-being, one of the strands of it is what we term spiritual well-being, meaning spiritual in the broader sense, whatever it means to you as an individual. Um, and it is really important. And we have found that people do feel a, I'm going to say, connection to nature. But that, again, is something it, it would mean different things to different people. Um, but it is of real value. Um, so, so, yes, yes, for sure. Great, fantastic. So we're just coming to, to the last, I think, two questions now. And um, we've already got through 20, so we've been flying through. It's great. Um, so the second to last one is... Um, about kind of the environmental social governance agenda. They've asked, are there any other market-based mechanisms that could be introduced to encourage more mainstream private sector investment? For example, in things like woodland establishment, rewilding, that kind of thing. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so with the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity, COP, um, Convention of the Parties coming up, um, a lot of countries are now committing to what they call the 30 by 30 target, which is making sure that 30 percent of the land area is under some form of protection by 2030. We are not going to be able to see that on public land. We are going to need private land to be under some sort of conservation um, action of whatever form that may take. Um, so we've got to start thinking really innovatively about how we engage people in doing and taking those sorts of actions. Um, and people have very different motivations as landowners for wanting to do it. Some of it is about wonder. Some of it is about leaving something to future generations. Some of it is just pure finance. Um, so coming up with ways that you can subsidise people taking um, good stewardship of their land and, and doing things good for conservation. Um, we were talking about like woodland creation and restoration um, for climate change. And uh, Norma made the point earlier that woodlands are a very long haul. So we've got to think about this 
in perpetuity you know how how do you encourage somebody to plant a woodland and that then actually look after it for their lifetime you know 50 years 100 years as opposed to doing it and then 10 years later their payment you know runs out and then they just scrub it up and it, it gets converted again so it was all very well when it started but it, it's never going to go anywhere so yeah we need to start thinking very innovatively um and not just on the short-term cycles that things like agri-environment schemes are which are you know seven to ten years payments for taking actions but then after that uh you know policies change and there's there's no longevity to the action there's a wonderful story, isn't there, about uh, an estate in Sussex which has been rewilded. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. instead of farming it traditionally, they decided they would allow a lot of it to go back to nature. And it's worked amazingly, even in the short term. The, the numbers of purple emperor butterflies have gone up, white storks have come back to breed. And so even in the short term, things can be done. And so that's another thing we can encourage farmers to do not just to feed the birds in winter, but to consider rewilding a bit of their farm. Yeah, I mean, um, after we came out of Brexit, obviously all our agri-environment schemes are set to change in the next few years, and um, the ELM policy is going to come in. Um, we still don't know really what form that's going to take. Um, so by that, I mean environmental land management. It's called ELM, sorry, I'm using an acronym. Um uh, we are all hoping as conservationists that some serious money put into subsidising things like rewilding, whether or not that's passive, as you said, like allowing land to reconvert naturally. So natural regeneration of, of forests or improvement of um, yeah, woodlands. Or to do something more active um, and actually be able, you know, help people invest in action that's going to have long term gain. But again, we've really got to think about the timescales involved in this and make sure that there's security to that land that's been invested in. I mean, if any of you would like to know, all you have to do is enter the word rewilding in your computer scanner and it'll come up with a book about this farm in Sussex and tell you what a success it's been. So it's a great British story, really. Fantastic. So uh, final question is, I could ask the panellists, if you could enact one policy tomorrow, what would it be and why? And perhaps you could just, if you want to make any kind of final brief remarks um, with that as well, that would be great. Well, maybe my answer would be to, to stop pouring rubbish into our rivers. That would be a good start. Um, for me, for UK uh, climate policy, um, I would like to see these commitments to increasing woodland cover, but doing so in the way that's best for biodiversity. So making sure it is done in a way that ensures that our woodlands, both existing, but also the ones that we are going to create, are in the most supreme ecological condition we can um, have them in. Fantastic. Lovely answers. Right. Well, that's just about all we've got time for. And um, so I would like to thank our speakers tonight for their excellent contributions. Um, I think there's a lot that we as Humanist Climate Action members and as environmentally minded people can take away from the discussion we've had tonight, uh, especially what we can be doing in both our own lives and also campaigning for change at that kind of government and policy level uh, to ensure that we protect our threatened species. So before we close, I'd just like to give a quick update on what Humanist Climate Action has planned um, kind of going forward. In the coming year, we'll be continuing to engage with government and select committee policy consultations, making sure that the humanist voice is heard on environmental issues and building our relationships with other environmental organisations as well. So you may have seen we launched our newsletter at the beginning of this month. Um, so that will cover activities that the committee is working on, and it will include tips on environmental actions we can all take and ways to challenge disinformation on environmental issues as well. On the topic of biodiversity, we'll also be looking towards uh, COP15, the much delayed Convention on Biological Diversity that Professor Davies mentioned, and calling for progress to be made towards all countries agreeing a plan to set nature in recovery. So we'd love to see more people joining the Humanist Climate Action Network and supporting these causes. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, please do visit our website and sign up for further information and also for our newsletter. So all that remains is to thank our fantastic speakers once again for sharing their expertise, a big round of applause, um, and to thank our audience for attending. We very much appreciate all of your support. Well, thank you. It's been great to be involved.
Yes, thank you very much.